fine. All right, let's get this going. You know it's up first. I get the coffee in. Hmm. Uh, howdy, y'all. Welcome to History by Phillips. I'm Mr. Phillips. You are watching part two of this lecture series of the Jackson era. Uh, last video, we talked about Jacksonian democracy. There, we pretty much talked about how more people are getting to vote. Uh, you don't have this requirement to own land. You don't have this requirement to pay a poll tax to be able to vote for your representatives anymore. Uh, when you see that, when we expand the electoral base, you start seeing more folks are voting for people like Jackson and rather than these founding fathers, these upper echelons, especially those from Virginia and the New England area. Uh, we like to, de us historians like to demarcate this as the time of the common man, if you want us to look at it that way. Uh, but yes, more folks are getting to voice their opinion in our democratic republic, and those people made their voices clear in the election of 1828. Uh, remember in 1824, we had the corrupt bargain. Jackson won the plurality of the votes, but he did not have a majority, meaning he didn't have over 50% of the electoral vote. Uh, check out the last video for that map for 1824. Uh, so long story short, uh, Henry Clay, he's the leader of Congress, uh, the House of Representatives. He's the Speaker of the House. That's what the leader of the House of Representatives is called, is the uh, Speaker of the House. He pretty much used his influence to get the to get uh, the House of Representatives to vote for John Quincy Adams, and in return, John Quincy Adams made Henry Clay the Secretary of State. That uh, at that time, typically when you're Secretary of State, that would slingshot you up to the presidency down the road. Uh, Jackson supporters started calling them so, uh, calling this the corrupt bargain of 1824. So here you'll start seeing the Democrat Party uh, split by the 1828 election. Those who support Jackson are be known as Democrats. Uh, the foundation of the Democratic Party today, some issues have changed, uh, but it's pretty much the same modern Democrat Party you see today, same logo, same everything. Uh, then you have the Nationalist Republicans. Uh, the National Republicans, they favor a strong central government, or as the uh, Democrats, they favor state rights, more or less. I digress, that's from last lesson. Today's lesson is going to be conflicts over lands. We'll be talking about pretty much Native American issues here. Mostly Cherokee and Seminole in nature. Uh, they had to deal with a lot of oppression back in the day. Uh, they were forced to pretty much move to modern day Oklahoma with other Indian tribes that are out there. Uh, the black mark in American history, but I digress. Let's get into it. So today, uh, we'll be talking about the tra Trail of Tears, mostly Cherokee in nature, and we'll be talking about the Seminole Wars. The two areas that will be geographically that we'll be talking about quite a bit is this region right here, North Georgia, Alabama, parts of North Carolina, and parts of East Tennessee. This will be the Cherokee. Think of this. This is the Cherokee Nation land. I mean, this is. It's kind of weird how Americans view it. Uh, view the map today. Uh, it's not necessarily we own all this land. Well, here in the east we do, but out west, uh, there's parts of reservations. Those are actual Indian tribes. Like, think of it as a le legitimate country recognized by the United States. But I digress. Well, back in the day, the Cherokee, uh, Choctaw, Chickasaw, all those uh, five, civilized tribes, five civilized tribes, they lived in this region. Uh, but rumor has it there's gold in this region, so they want to get them out. Uh, the white man's expanding. They're coveting land. Uh, this will progress into manifest destiny. That is the American belief that we should conquer this land all the way up to the Pacific Ocean. But we'll be talking about that next next chapter. And we'll also be talking about the Seminole Wars. This will be one of the only five civilized tribes to successfully resist. It would take them well over 30 years to, what you say, uh, successfully remove those Indians from Florida. But it took a while. Uh, Osala, uh, it was the... A leader of the Seminoles. We'll talk about that. So first, let's talk about the Cherokees and the Trail of Tears. So removing Native Americans. I mean, Native American tribes, sorry for that typo right there, uh, got along with European settlers. Uh, these tribes were known as the five civilized tribes. And when most folks, they think of Indians, they think of like hair, I mean, headdresses and, I don't know, fancy jewelry and stuff like that. But for the most part, I mean, they're just pretty much white Americans just with a darker skin collection. Uh, 
not as dark as African American slaves, but it's just tan Americans basically. I mean, they dress like the white settlers. They act like the white settlers. Set up. They have constitutions, laws, you name it. It's basically just the Indian version of European influence here. Uh, but these five tribes. Uh, once again, we mentioned the Cherokee here in this region. Uh, we got creeks below them, Choctaws and Chickasaws over toward the Mississippi, and you got the Seminoles now toward uh, Florida. Well, Americans wanted this land. Uh, a lot of this is going to be, they're going to not only want this land, but they're going to go all the way up toward California to take it over. But first, they wanted this, a good farmland. And there's rumors it's going to be gold here in the Georgian Hills. Uh, so that's going to make a lot of Americans want the federal government to remove these Indians. So let's talk about removing Native Americans. Uh, there's rumors of gold in Georgian Hills. So settlers not, not only wanting more land for, you know, just to have property, the farm and all that, but there's gold. Everybody wants money, they want it. Uh, I don't think they really, just, I mean, they found some gold, but not as much as the rumors have been. Uh, so President Jackson, uh, he passed the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Uh, this is essentially saying, hey, all you civilized tribe Indians, we're gonna pay you to move to the Indian Territory. At the time, the Indian Territory was Oklahoma. Uh, it's a wasteland. Oklahoma's not talk bad about uh, another state, but Oklahoma, like compared to where these Indians were living, like the hunting's not as good, the farmland's not as good, the climate's terrible, so on and so forth. It's a wasteland. It's not their home. Uh, but they'll pay Indians to move west to pretty much the Indian Territory, Oklahoma. Uh, the Cherokees refused to do this. Though. There's about 17,000 Cherokees living here at the time. They refused to do this. Uh, well, Georgia... They're enforcing federal law on Cherokee land. Now, remember, uh, imagine this is a separate country. That's the best way to picture it. I mean, American laws, United States laws do not apply to this region at the time. This is its own country. Uh, but you have Georgia enforcing these laws because, once again, President Jackson passed this law, uh, federal law saying in the Removal Act, uh, pretty much pay or we're going to make you go to Oklahoma. Uh, the Cherokee are refusing. They're resisting. So the... Uh, Cherokee chief, John Ross, I don't know if, uh, John Ross, right here. This is the Cherokee chief right here. Uh, not a white man or nothing like that. He is a Cherokee. He's the chief of the Cherokees, uh, John Ross. Let me find my, where was I at? Nope, nope, nope. Here we go. Uh, refused to leave. Uh, Worcester versus Georgia. So this guy, he's a Worcester. He's a missionary living with the Cherokees in Georgia. He helps these Indians with legislation, how to uh, protest this in court, so on and so forth. Well, they're protesting that Georgia has no right to remove these Indians because, once again, these Indians are on their own land granted to them by treaties from the American Revolution, War of 1812, so on and so forth. Uh, this land was given to them by or recognized by the United States in various treaties. Uh, so this goes up to the Supreme Court saying, basically, Georgia has no right to interfere with Cherokee involvement, and the Supreme Court agrees with them. Uh, Chief Justice John Marshall's like, hey, we cannot force U.S. laws in Cherokee Nation land. It's against the law. Well, Jackson just flat out ignores him. Uh, he says Chief John Marshall's made his decision. Now let him enforce it. Basically, you have Jackson saying, you know, I don't care what the Supreme Court says. We're going to remove them anyway. What are they going to do about it? Uh, and he's right. I mean, what is the Supreme Court? Is he going to swing his gavel at Andrew? I mean, Andrew Jackson's going to do what he wants here. Uh, but should a president do this? Should the president just flat out ignore another branch of the United States government? Uh, this is where people start accusing Andrew Jackson of being a king or a tyrant. Uh, I should have put that political cartoon up in here. But you have Jackson just flat out ignoring the Supreme Court. Just about as bad as John Adams' Alien and Sedition Acts. This is like, whoa, uh, very unconstitutional and unprecedented at the time. Uh, so he flat out ignores this decision and they start removing the Indians anyway. So removing the Indians, or Cherokee mostly in nature. Uh, the U.S. forced a group of Cherokee to sign some bogus treaty, the Treaty of New Etowah. Uh, so basically, that's about a group of 500 Cherokees. They do not represent the Cherokee Nation. Once again, uh, we established that this is John Ross. He is the leader of the Cherokee. Think of him as the Cherokee president, the king, whatever. This is Chief John Ross, uh, leader of the Cherokees. He was not part of this treaty right here. Uh, but basically, they got some Cherokees to sign some bogus treaty saying they will be gone by 1838 or the U.S. Army will remove them. Uh, 
a lot of these Cherokees like, hey, this is a bogus treaty. You just got some random punks to sign it. That ain't fair. What are you doing? You can talk to John Ross. Well, Andrew Jackson don't care. All he sees is a piece of paper signed by some Indian. We're going to move you anyway. Uh, 1838 comes around. Now, only 2,000 out of these 17 Cherokees have actually made it to uh, Oklahoma at this time. But a lot of them's like, no, we're not moving. Well, by, by the end of Andrew, uh, Andrew Jackson's second term as president, uh, his successor, Martin Van Buren, would come over. As soon as he came to office, he would uh, finish out Jackson's legislation, and he would enforce the Removal Act. Uh, he would send about 7,000 troops into the Cherokee Nation, round them up, and they would force them to march uh, pretty much along Tennessee through Arkansas to modern-day eastern Oklahoma. This would be in 18th. This would this was between June 1838 to December uh, 1838. Uh, 2,000 died before they even started. 2,000 more died along the trails. And I'll say so once they got established, it's about 10,000 Cherokee left. About a quarter of them died off as soon as they got established. So you basically wiped off over half of a, uh, of a group. You almost committed genocide here. You almost eliminated an entirety ethnic group here. Uh, you can say this is about as bad as the uh, Holocaust with the elimination of the Jews back in the 1940s, uh, but we'll talk, y'all learn about that more in high school. Oh, I digress. But you have the Cherokees, about 17,000 strong at a time. By the time it gets done, they're down to about five, 6,000 uh, Cherokee citizens left. Uh, very brutal. Uh, they was not well prepared. They was marching through the snow. They didn't have time to get ready. Uh, forced to march. This is women, children, elderly, uh, the sick. Uh, they just dying along the trails. If you see here, well, my thing's in the way, but I digress. Very brutal. Uh, very brutal. Uh, yeah, I can't get there without that thing popping up. I digress. Uh, let's move on. Uh, resistance and removal. So they, it's the Seminoles was the only tribe to successfully resist, uh, but they would still in the long run end up having to be forced out of Florida as well. Uh, the leader was Osada. Uh, this guy right here, he would be the leader of the Seminoles. They basically claimed this region right here. Now, Seminoles, they would be able to bolster their numbers with runaway slaves. Uh, you still have the slavery going on in the South because remember, the Southern economy is based on uh, agriculture, and that uh, agriculture is backed by slave labor. So a lot of slaves from like Tennessee, South Carolina, Georgia, they would run away and run south, and they would eventually join up with the Seminoles. We would call these folks Black Seminoles. Uh, I digress. So part of this Indian Removal Act, uh, they start sending troops down to uh, Florida in 1835 with major uh, major Dade, but Dade gets caught off guard and he gets massacred. The Seminoles whip him. It'll be known as Dade Massacre. Make note of that. There's usually a uh, PCAP question about that. But yeah, Francis Dade, he marched, uh, Major Francis Dade, he would march uh, the U.S. Army down part of it, and they'll get caught off guard and massacred. Uh, but once again, the Seminoles, they'd get help from the runaway slaves. They would be known as Black Seminoles. The Seminoles would integrate them into their society. Uh, you start seeing these what we call maroon societies popping up along the Gulf Coast. But hopefully, you learn more some about that in college. Uh, if you I uh, digress. Uh, the Seminole Wars they would not end till about 1858, right up to the Civil War. Uh, over three decades of fighting, just about close to three decades of fighting. It would cost the U.S. over 20 million dollars. I mean, this was a long, drawn-out war. Uh, yeah, one of, one of the blunders of the U.S. Army right here. Uh, but I digress. We eventually got all the Indians rounded up. Now we're going to put all these civilized tribes in Oklahoma. Now what President Jackson's thinking and all these advisors think is like, all right, we're going to look at Oklahoma on the map and we're just going to divide it up. All right, Cherokee live here, Creeks live here, so on and so forth. Kind of makes sense if you look at it that way. But what they didn't realize is there's more Native American tribes living out this way. Uh, we call them the Great Plains Indians. You've got the Osage, the Comanches, and the Kiowas, just to name a few. Uh, I'm trying to think of the other ones. Yeah, uh, Comanches, Apaches are kind of close by, the Lakotas. Uh, all these Indians are already living here. And all of a sudden, they have some, not random tribe, but just almost 
just foreigners getting dumped in on top of them. This is going to cause a lot of infighting with various Indian tribes. Uh, disease is going to run rampant. You have a bunch of new people congregating in one area. Uh, I digress. But the five civilized tribes, they would end up losing over 100 million acres of land. Uh, they would get put into this pretty much little area called uh, the, the Indian Territory. It's only about 60 million acres altogether. Uh, they got paid some, but not not enough. Uh, many problems would occur in their Oh, yeah. But like I said, the civilized tribes are getting dumped in on top of these Great Plains. The Indians are there. It's because of the infighting. So the U.S. Army, they built forts. A lot of these forts are named after Indians. Like you got Fort Kiowa, Fort Comanche, all that stuff. Uh, they're out there. And what you'll start seeing is the rise of Indians working for the government almost. So you'll see a Choctaw police force. They'll be known as the Light Horsemen. I think they hung around till the early 1900s. Uh, they might be some remnants of it still today. I digress. But basically, uh, during the Jackson age, uh, Indians had it bad. If he was an Indian and he was under President Jackson's reign, probably didn't have it too good, especially the Cherokees. Uh, Cherokees got removed pretty much from where we live, all the way to Oklahoma, into a no man's land, a wasteland. The farming's not good. The hunting's not good. The fishing's, fishing's all right. But it's not the same. It's not what they grew up to. It's not. No, no, they're not used to it. They have to adapt to it. And a lot of it, a lot of folks couldn't adapt to this new lifestyle change. Uh, the Seminoles, they would fight and resist for a good while, but eventually they get uh, lose out, and a lot of them have to go to Oklahoma as well. But that's it for today's lesson. Uh, hopefully, learn something about Indian removal and Indian resistance. Very dark times, especially the Trail of Tears. Uh, tomorrow we'll be talking about Andrew Jackson. And the bank, I'll give you a hint. Andrew Jackson hates the bank. Andrew Jackson hates rich folk. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, Say he almost hates them as much as he does Indians. Uh, pretty brutal time period in the uh, U.S. history here between the 20s and 40s here. Uh, but I digress. This has been History by Phillips. I've been Mr. Phillips. Everybody take care. Be safe. And I will see y'all in study block.